morning. Uh, I hope there's some sore heads out there. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Karen Nelson-Field, who is one of the leading global authorities on the science behind sharing. Uh, behind sharing and uh, the author of a soon-to-be-released book uh, entitled Viral Marketing, The Science Behind Sharing. Um, and what we're going to do in the course of the next 25 minutes is help debunk some of the commonly held content myths that shroud the industry and that actually, um, I think, stop content market marketing from moving forward at the pace that it probably des deserves to. Um, you may know Unruly from the viral video chart, um, which we've been running since 2007, uh, and which is the de facto database of sharing globally. So it scans the web every day. Every time it finds a new video, it sends back the data to Unruly about that video's sharing uh, information, who's been sharing it, what platforms they've been sharing it on. And we've, looked, we've scanned over 320 billion video streams uh, since 2007. So it's a big database. Um, but what fascinates Unruly and uh, what fascinates Karen is not the sheer size of the data, but, but why? Why is certain content shared, and why is certain content, other content not shared, that seemed uh, to have the same kind of characteristics? Um, and we were really, really excited when we realized that it wasn't just Unruly that was absolutely fascinated by the why, um, when we realized that Karen at the, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute in Adelaide was uh, equally passionate about this subject matter. Um, so there's explosive growth in sharing of all things uh, on the web. So uh, there's four billion items shared per day on Facebook at the moment. Um, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg has, uh, has advocated that the amount of content shared on Facebook will double every year, year on year. Um, but what's interesting for brands and advertisers is that this isn't just non-branded content that's being shared. There's been an explosion in branded content sharing. So if you look at the top three most shared videos in 2006, those three videos got a combined total of 1.6 million shares. Fast forward to 2012, the top three most shared bits of branded content got almost 18 million shares. So this is exponential. So there is a huge wave of consumer sharing of branded content that can be harnessed by brands if they make the right content. Why is sharing important? Well, it drives brand metrics. Um, and it also drives sales. So the McKinsey report in 2010 stated that 20 to 50% of all purchase decisions were based on word of mouth recommendation. And sh video sharing is electronic word of mouth marketing writ large on digital platforms. Um, there's a Nielsen study that came out recently that, that showed trust in media channels between 2009 and 2012. Uh, traditional media channels such as TV dropped from 75% to 49%. The only channel that in increased in trust was word of mouth, and that increased from 90% trust to a whopping 90.07. Um, but it's still, it's hugely, hugely important in the decision-making buying progress, buying process. Karen. Thanks, Phil, for the introduction. I've traveled a very long way to hopefully live up to that introduction. As an academic, I acknowledge I'm constantly learning, so I'm not sure if I'm an expert yet. I might be an expert when I'm 100, which is a long way away, just so you know. Um, I just thought I'd start um, with a little bit about, well, Phil actually asked me to start about the philosophy behind our research at the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. Some of you may have heard of us, um, but our philosophy is quite different to a typical research agency. We are part of a university, um, but we're also an independent research agency. Um, so I wanted to start with um, a quote that's resonated with me at a conference that I was at in New York, basically this time last year, whoever was at the Rethink conference. Um, and the then president of the ARF, Bob Roche, said in his opening address, he said, in the age of new media, change is happening ahead of learning. And I think that's really powerful. I think things are moving so fast, and we've all been told of that in the last couple of days, that marketers often get caught up in the hype and apply concepts that are less tested. Um, so what we, we see is that they apply, apply findings from perhaps single sets of data or case studies or what we call ephemeral or single instance studies. Um, but unfortunately, good science, or unfortunately, good science is based on replication. Um, so only studies that can see findings hold across differing boundary conditions with 
differing sets of data are those that are good for predictive value. And that's the philosophy for the Ehrenberg Bass Institute and the philosophy for the research that we've done in the last two years. Um, so when you look at any other science, you know, you don't see new drugs going out to market before it's tested for often years, or new building materials, or even new technology, yet it is kind of bewildering that marketers can invest often millions of dollars with studies that findings have been found to hold in one set of data. So that's the philosophy behind our research. We call this the empirical generalization approach. So for a bit of background, which is why there's an appropriately cued slide with lots of videos on it, um, my work has included nine studies, five sets of data, or data, I'm told I should pronounce it data, um, and a thousand videos. So how have Unruly and I collaborated? Um, about two years ago, I was um, fortunate to be given a large set of user-generated data with all of the sharing metrics behind it that I needed, but obviously to make sure that the findings held across different boundary conditions, I needed extra data, which is where Unruly came in and they were um, gracious enough to give me multiple sets of branded data. So we've been collaborating for about two years. Okay, this is me. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background in terms of um, where we started this journey. Um, emotions are long noted to positively impact at effectiveness, um, and we thought this was probably the best place to start. We've kind of moved along that journey since then, but this is a best way to, to begin. Um, more recently, emotional intensity has been linked to uh, forwarding of emails, um, survival of folklore and memes, and even in the psychology literature, there's a concept called social sharing, which suggests that how much you or how many people you share an experience with depends on how emotionally intense that experience was. So we wanted to see whether emotional intensity um, potentially could be linked to sharing of video. We also wanted to understand what uh, role arousal plays, um, so whether videos that are positive or negative have an impact, and perhaps this might seem obvious to you, but the fact is the literature is quite conflicted in terms of results in that way. Um, so just quickly skimming the surface, um, in the literature, uh, what Phil calls emotional intensity, we actually operationalize as arousal, um, and arousing emotions are those that cause a physiological response. Um, so for example, things that literally make you gasp or hold your breath or physical tears or laughter or goosebumps, etc. There's plenty of other arousing jokes that go around. Um, <laughs> Um, so just in a bit of a nutshell, there's actually a long whole chapter in the book about the background to emotions testing and we recognise that testing emotions is quite subjective so we did a number of measures to ensure that we minimised our subjectivity, one of which was to develop um, this grid which is based on pairs. So pairs are better than scales when the underlying measure is subjective, um, whereby we had um, a high arousal emotion and a low arousal emotion which, so for example, hilarity is the upscaled version of amusement in the humour um, uh, quadrant. Um, so we used pairs, we also double coded at least all of our data, so it, it took months and months and months with the thousand videos that we had um, and our intercode agreement was in the 90s, 90% 90 plus, so we're quite comfortable with the results. Um, so just in terms of some of the top level results, and some of you may have read these before, but in a nutshell, we found that high arousal emotions share by far more than low arousal emotions, probably not that much of a surprise, but we found this consistent across all data. So whether it was branded, non-branded, um, other variables within that. We also found that arousal did play a role, but slightly lesser extent, so the arousal element was the most significant in all studies. Um, arousal played a role, so high arousal positive emotions, so you can see high arousal positive, low arousal positive, high arousal negative, <coughs> low arousal negative, so the high arousal positive emotions um, shared 30% more than any other arousal valence group, and again, this was consistent across all data sets, so there were no difference. Um, one other thing which we're not talking a lot about today, but while we're on the high arousal positive um, 
bandwagon. I've also done some additional studies which we were fortunate enough to get um, some data with um, videos and actual in-market sales with single source data and we found a direct link between high arousal positive emotions and sales, the holy grail. We also found um, high risk recall scores for high arousal positive as well, so better for memory. Um, so we took uh, the findings of Karen's research and then, uh, as ever, we've tried to build on that research to be able to make something which is applicable in the industry, which is important to everyone. So um, we've isolated from psychology literature and the work Karen's done 18 emotional responses that can be tested for um, at either a moderate, strong or intense uh, against those uh, emotional responses. And you might be asking why we had Daniel Day-Lewis on the previous slide. And I think if we're looking for a barometer of emotional intensity, um, we probably can't do any better than Daniel Day-Lewis because I don't think Daniel Day-Lewis does mildly aroused. I think he is strongly or intensely aroused most of the time uh, on screen. And so uh, what, what's unfortunate is that of the, all the branded content that we tested, the majority of it doesn't do the same. Um, and I think the reason for that is because of the subjectivity of the process. Um, so what starts off as a fantastic uh, creative idea that it gets everybody excited tends to get watered down via rounds of sign-off and subjective chin stroking because there isn't an objective framework available to creatives and to marketers and to agencies to be able to assess content for emotional intensity. Can I add to that? Interestingly, um, that even though you might all say, well, it's obvious that anything that has arousing content in it will share more, but 70% of the data that we had actually evoked low arousal emotions. So even though, to your point, marketers think that, yeah, fair enough, it, they're just not hitting the mark. Yep. So, so I think what's quite interesting is if you then, I mean, we, uh, we, since last July, we've tested over 200 bits of branded content in our social video lab in London, testing for emotional intensity using panel of consumers. And what's quite interesting is when you start to map the emotions that are prevalent in particular sectors, you really start to find these patterns. Um, so for example, in the automotive industry, of all the content that we tested, tend to cluster around the emotion of cool and exhilarating. So whether marketers know it or not, or the creatives know it or not, they're, they're following a very similar path to all the other marketers in their sector. Similarly with consumer electronics, knowledge is the key thing, uh, the key emotion that um, electronics advertisers tend to try and push because it's the knowledge that imparts the product features and then they use a secondary emotion like hilarity or surprise in order to be able to tell that story and make it interesting. So if you're an advertiser and you can suddenly get a framework and a map of what's happening in your market and your competitive uh, and your competitive set and the kinds of emotional responses that your comp competition are going for and the kinds of responses that are working well for your target audience, you can suddenly start to go, hold on a minute, there's a real opportunity for us here to try and harness this specific emotion and then go hard after that emotion. Um, so we've taken all of that stuff and put it together and created an algorithm um, called ShareRank. And basically what ShareRank seeks to do is to be able to use this emotional testing and come up with a score between 1 and 10 uh, on a piece of video. Um, and based upon that score between 1 and 10, we can predict earned media or share rates within 80% confidence bounds. Um, we've worked with a, cons a global consumer tech brand, we've worked with a global FMCG brand, we've worked with a global autos brand, and we have been predicting pretty accurately the amount of shares that that piece of content is going to get before the asset has even been put live. Um, and what's interesting is that across those 200 bits of branded content that we tested, the average score was a 5.5. So what, was, what we're not saying here is that all branded content is, isn't very good. What we're saying is that the content that's been made is not being optimized for the social web, and it's not been optimized for emotional intensity. So what we're about is trying to help a brand move from a 5.5 to a 6, to a 6.5, to a 7. Because once you can start to move up those numbers, the gains become exponential, as you can see from the, from the graph. Karen's now going to dispel some commonly held content myths. And I don't think it would be Aaron Berg Bass Institute unless we said something controversial and something about debunking myths. So, um, within the journey of the last two years, we um, also looked at um, branding, obviously. Um, one myth that is very prevalent in industry is that branding puts people off sharing, does it? Well, many marketers think so. 
And I think that we're often told that if you, if, um, you want to engage with your consumers, then you have to dial down the marketing. I've even read it in some of the, the popular books about social video. So dial down your marketing. Don't treat it like any normal advertising. Make sure your brand is hidden. Um, take a low profile approach. Um, and interestingly, even from the data, I mean, I can see this happening anyway, but even from the data, I can see that marketers are listening. We subcoded all of the data, all the branded data, by objective measures of uh, branding execution. And what we found is that um, the amount of times a brand appears in a social video is one third of that of a traditional TV ad. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely taking a low profile approach. But perhaps what's even more scary is that the first impression is usually a third of the way through the video. So you can imagine how many people are actually turning off and not even knowing that it's your brand that's, that's, that's their advertising, or worse, that it's misattributed to your competitor. Um, so does branding affect sharing? You know what? We find zero evidence. Um, we found we, we did as many tests and correlations and regressions, and we found no relationship between sharing and branding. We found no difference in sharing between high and low um, arousal videos. And interestingly, we found that high arousal positive videos w had the greatest frequency of branding, yet they're the ones that share the most. So myth debunked, officially. Yeah, and I think, um, so we've got, an ex we've got a few examples here of content that um, kind of plays to these myths and we've got on the top right hand corner a Peugeot ad where they've got some body popper kind of dancing in a car park with a Peugeot car behind it and the let your body drive strap line doesn't actually come into the video until 2 minutes 55 and we see drop off rates happening at 1 minute 30 generally so for that brand they had a huge wasted opportunity and they should have been, I think the old school method of branded content was do a stunt, and then at the end, the brand goes, da-da, it was us all along, and consumers feel a little bit cheated about that and a little bit put off. So the new school methodology is the brand welcomes you into the content story, is up front and center, and go, we're going to go on a journey together and take you on that journey. And I think that's the difference between the old school viral and the new school uh, of branded content. OK, myth number two, that creative device is responsible for sharing. I think you'll agree with me that any blog or article that you read about the top 20 videos or the top 30 videos of the year or whatever will put its success down to creative device that an animal or a sexy guy or um, celebrity or babies is the key to its success. Well, they're not wrong, but they're not entirely correct either. Um, and it's all about measurement. When you only are looking at winning videos and you fail to look at a representative sample and you don't look at losing videos, if that's not the word you want to use, um, you're only telling half the story. And that's unfortunate with poor research. So the fact is that creative devices, what we found is creative devices can be equally successful and non-successful. So you can have a baby that shares hugely well, and you can have a baby that shares really poorly. And you can have a baby that's high arousing, which we saw yesterday, and but you can also have a video that's a baby that just you know, bores you silly. Um, so the fact is they can be equally successful and non-successful. They can be equally arousing and low arousing. There is one exception. Um, so personal triumph without a doubt is the exception here. It shares significantly more than any other device, regardless of whether it's in the low or high arousal form. Um, but unfortunately, only 3% of all the branded videos that we've analyzed could actually have actually implemented this. And we kind of say, well, I guess it's difficult to um, implement personal triumph when it potentially is a brand that's like toilet tissue that's not really triumphant. <laughs> um, but the lesson here is that focus less on the heart, focus less on the creative device and make sure that whatever creative device you do choose that the arousal within that is, is high. So again, we've got a couple of ex uh, some examples up here that I could talk to all of them, but the bottom two here are interesting because they're both advertisers who sponsored the James Bond film Skyfall. Um, one of the advertisers chose to use Daniel Craig in their content, um, who's a highly paid actor that you may know of, um, and the other one decided to do a flash mob style stunt where users, uh, consumers had to run through a train station doing a challenge, getting balls thrown at them in order to get to a Coke Zero machine and then win some tickets for the premiere. One of these videos got uh, a million shares and 10 million views on YouTube, and the other one got 50,000 shares. Now, I love both of these brands, so I'm going to leave it up to you to decide which one is which. But 
you know, was it the one that had the highly paid celebrity in it that did better, or was it the one that just had a great creative story and managed to execute it well? Okay, and my final myth is perhaps the most controversial, so get your tweaking or what is the word that they use, tweak, where it was critical tweeting, whatever. Um, and perhaps the most difficult for me to explain in two minutes, um, and I've been spending probably the last nine months on this. Um, but we're told content is king and that quality content is key to sharing. Um, again, that's not wrong, but it's not entirely correct. Um, and again, it's also about measurement. So anyone that tells you this will only have ever measured creative variables. But in our data, we actually looked at creative and the combined impact of creative and distribution variables. And what we found in our regression is that the single largest contributor or predictor of sharing is actually distribution. So. Um, and this is because the pass along rate or reproduction rate or forwarding rate or whatever you want to kind of however you want to label it is actually a fraction of what you expect, which is perhaps going to um, challenge the diehard viral marketers in the room. Videos don't actually get shared that often. Even our best examples with high arousal and personal triumph needed eight views to get one share. And that was our best example. So the average across all our data was 24. Um, so what this means then, and I know Phil is going to give you a bit more background to this, but if you start with a small viewing base, obviously mathematically the, the video will remain small because the burnout rate is less than one to one, so it will quickly diffuse. Um, but if you start with a larger base, um, even if the creative is not awesome, you'll still get or gain more incremental shares. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with Duncan Watts, this is the concept that he advocates called big seeding. So you have to read his work. He's now with Microsoft. Um, so I think that the biggest mistake that marketers make in the social video space is the analogy we, we draw with biological disease. God knows where that came from, that as a video you can infect one person and it spreads to millions. It's actually the opposite way around. Um, so the reality is that videos behave a lot more like normal brands than you think, um, and they need a combination of mental and physical availability to get big, so good creative and good distribution. Yeah, and um, I think the idea that you can just target a group of influencers and put the content to those influencers and then it's going to spread is a bit of a misnomer and it's kind of based loosely on Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point which has since be de be, uh, been debunked. And what we find here is that you need to get content to a mass awareness for it to start to be able to live and breathe and, and become contagious. Um, and I think what, what brands need to do is have not only the sniper approach of, of activating those influencers because they are important, but also the shotgun um, in order to get that content into the mass consciousness. Um, and especially important if you look at the social diffusion curve. So this is showing the half-life of sharing. So uh, a quarter of shares happen in the first three days uh, of a video's life. And then a further quarter, so 50% of, of the overall shares happen in the first three weeks. So if you're a brand and you don't have a very coordinated distribution strategy and you put the video live on YouTube, see how it does, and then a few weeks later, right, okay, our paid distribution is going to start, you've probably missed a whole heap of sharing and conversation and electronic word of mouth that you could have had during that period. Um, so we're running out of time, but we're going to leave you with a video. So all this is very well in theory, but what about the practice? So Renault came to Unruly via their agency, MGOMD, said, look, you know all this stuff. Can you make us a video? So this is what we did. Mr. Vanelman, nice to meet you. You here for your test drive? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Right, well, yeah, if you can just thanks. take a seat. Hello there, Mr. Meredith. Yeah, thanks. Have a seat. You're here for the test drive. Uh, sure enough. Got seat adjustment under there. Just here? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. What we're going to do, we're just going to drive down, head out this way. Okay. The base sound system on this is absolutely fantastic. Built-in navigation system. Never no. get lost again here? Never get lost again. Yeah, left here. Yep. Now's a good time to demonstrate the Vava Voom button. Um, okay. That's amazing. <laughs>
Thank you. Nicole. Take a chair, take a chair. This is mental. Oh my gosh. don't want to subject you uh, to any more of that gratuitous. I'm sure I want to be subjected um, to a lot more of that. That's gratuitous for female bodies, but you get the point. So we basically made this based on a formula that we've created. So he said, okay, weave the brand in, that was done. Um, make sure the brand's part of the storyline, yep, get that. Um, which triggers do we want to go for? Well, we went for the trigger of sexy. Um, but what's interesting is that actually, um, we didn't nail it 10 out of 10. We actually, if you, you did a share rank on this, it would probably come out at about 6.5 or a 7. So even though we had all this knowledge and this, this data and this information and we tried to put it into a video, we didn't manage to knock it out of the park as far as we could do because actually, if you think about it, if we'd have tried to do sexy 10 out of 10 on that video, those ladies wouldn't have had any clothes on. And th that wouldn't have been very good for Renault. Um, and I don't think the Advertising Standards Authority would have been very happy about it either. So what we're saying here is that even though brands might know that they should be hitting emotional triggers, it's a difficult thing to be able to do. But what's interesting about that is that we had a very coordinated distribution strategy um, where we tried to get as many views as we possibly could within the first week. And um, that video has got over 4 million views on YouTube and Renault paid for 500,000 of them. So that's 8 to 1 earned to paid. Um, and that is basically good content that hits an emotional trigger and the right distribution strategy put together hand in hand. And I think um, the key learning to take away from today is that actually distribution is king, but, but content itself um, should be a very highly emotional queen. Thank you. Thank you.